beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And all that God created was good, including man and woman. The Garden of Eden was their home, and in the midst of the garden, there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave them specific instructions saying, if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. Well, we chose the latter. And this death formed a separation between God and all mankind, a.k.a. the veil. This veil was implemented for our protection, but also existed because of our choice. The veil limited our ability to fellowship with God because of this. God's influence on mankind was minuscule at best. And the dominant influence on the heart of man became darkness. Although we rejected God, his heart still burned deeply for our fellowship, not just for one of us, but all of us equally. Amen. In all his wisdom, a plan was implemented that would satisfy his anger and justify us before his holiness without violating his own character in the process. This powerful action of obedience removed the sin that caused the veil to be implemented in the first place. Amen. The veil was torn, signifying that there is nothing separating us from God's blessed influence anymore. The veil that once kept us confined, to, the, the veil that once kept God confined to a room here on earth has now been torn down. And now God, by his spirit, has been released and poured out on all mankind. Amen. Now the veils that are erected is the veils that we put up ourselves. To veil something means to cover, to hide, to block, view of. To unveil something means to uncover, expose, reveal. Amen. And so let's get into the prophecy and the veil. We must tear down our veils that are blocking us from experiencing all that God has for us. One way we block God is by placing a veil over our spiritual ears and our spiritual sight. Prophecy. The meaning of prophecy is the ability to hear God and translate it into intelligible speech, foretelling the future events about a person a place or a thing. Amen. Prophecies meaning AKA a word, you know, hey, you know, you in church, I got a word. I got a word. It means to utter by divine inspiration to predict with assurance on the basis of spiritual knowledge. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse three in the Amplified says be on. But on the other hand, be uh, on the other hand, the one who prophesies, who interprets the divine will and purpose, inspired preaching and teaching, speaks to men, but they're up for their upbuilding and constructive spiritual progress and encouragement and consolation. In the Old Testament, God gave glimpses of his plan through the prophets with the spirit of prophecy about his first coming. For example... In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between the seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This is the judgment that God gave to the serpent right after Eve and Adam and Eve fell. Amen. And so God began to, the first um, prophecy towards the devil's future and the serpent's future was this. He says, it shall bruise thy head, and the second, thou shalt bruise his heel. What is God talking about here? In the context, he's telling the devil his future, right? So a lot of times, if we are not careful as believers, we can we cannot we are not be able to interpret what God is saying because we are veiled to hearing his voice through the scriptures. Amen. We all know that God is talking about what Jesus was going. He is prophesying of his coming son. Amen. And so we have to be open to um, allowing the Lord Jesus to open our eyes to the scriptures so we'll see what God's true intentions and why it was written in the first place. Amen. The second example is this. Here is another example. Psalm 78 verse 1 through 4. 
Give ear, O people, to my laws. Incline your ear to my word, to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which, which have been heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide from them, uh, we will not hide them from their children, telling the generation to come uh, to praise the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. All right, the context of this scripture is the Psalms, and we in Psalm 78. But the person who wrote this actual verse, his name is Asaph. His name is Asaph. Asaph was a teacher in the courts of David. And he was a powerful teacher. And he, this teaching, in context, was written to encourage God's people to live according to the law. Right? All right? But the prophetic utterance in the scriptures is, I will open my mouth in a parable. What is... Who else said that they would open their mouth in a parable? Jesus. So the context of the scriptures is talking about encouraging people to follow the law. But the utterance, the prophetic utterance is really talking about Jesus in this passage, right? Because he said, I will open my mouth in a parable. Jesus said, nothing I teach to them, I will not teach, I will only teach in parables. Right. So this is a prophetic word talking about Jesus. All right. The verse is talking about our master, dark sands. Let's look at let's go into deeper meaning of the dark sands. In the Greek, dark sands means riddle. A perplexing saying, a question. All right. Perplexing questions similar to the one. Similar to the one that the Queen of Sheba came to question um, Solomon with. Amen. And so that that is what that dark saying means. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I taught about allegories. Do you all remember I was, I was teaching about allegories? Allegory is a story within a story. Right. And many times this is how the Bible is written. Many times there is a story within a story. There is a meaning behind what it's saying. All right. And so. In order, my job as your pastor is to help you see not only what the, to expose you what the scriptures are saying, but to expose you to the prophetic utterance of what the scripture is really, why Jesus even wrote, put this in the Bible in the first place. Amen. It's not just so you may know it, but also so you may, so you may understand the revelation behind what was written. Amen. And that's my, as your pastor, I care about um, you growing in your spiritual discernment in what you are interpreting from the Bible. Amen. Because you can be biblically right and spiritually wrong. You could be right in what you're saying, but your spirit is wrong. And why you even implemented it in the first place. It's like this. You're in a bad relationship and that relationship is obviously toxic and physically uh, demanding and, and, and he beating on you. And then some church members say you just should just forgive them. Just keep forgiving them. It is OK to forgive, but you don't even love yourself if you stay in that condition. So biblically, yeah, you're right. I should forgive them, but I'm about to go because I'm, I'm, I, I care about my life too much. Right. So you have religious individuals who know the scriptures like Paul did, who know the scriptures. The, they know the Torah back and forth, can mem memorize. the. Just, a, just imagine being in a place where people memorize the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, knew it just, and was a million miles away. Couldn't even recognize when Jesus himself was right in front of him. So I don't want you to be religious. I don't want you to just know the scriptures, but I want you to know the heart behind why the scriptures was even written in the first place. The abundance of God's heart. The Bible is the abundance of God's heart spoken to you. Amen. But it needs to be spiritually discerned. Amen. The natural man would never understand the spiritual things of God because they are spiritually discerned. Amen. John chapter 1, verse 11 through 12 says, he came to his own he, and, and his own did not receive him. But as many received him, 
To them, he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. Amen. So those who are keen and open to seeing and hearing what God is saying or have their spiritual senses um, trained to be able to recognize what God is doing. Those who received Jesus by recognizing him went and changed the world. But those who didn't recognize him, they stayed the same. Have you recognized Jesus? Are you still living your same life that you lived before? Amen. Because you recognize Jesus, he will change you. He will alter your reality. He will change your perspective in how you view things. Amen. He will cause you to do things that you never would, you never would have done by yourself. He will cause you to step outside of your comfort zone and be who he's intended for you to be, not what they told you growing up, not the aspect and the personality traits that you develop from your life. Amen. You wasn't born like this. You became like this from your relationships. All right. So a lot of times Jesus has to reverse and bring us back into a childlike state so he can teach us again. Amen. So it's very imperative that you grow in, in the knowledge of Jesus, but also grow in applying what he is teaching you so he can begin to reverse the effects of the, the human condition in your life. What is the reversing of the? It's called healing. Amen. It's called restoration. It's called bringing back to new. Amen. It's called starting your life over again. It's called being a new creature in Christ. Old things passed away and all things become new. Amen. It's, 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 He's talking about having a fresh start. And many times we can have a fresh start because we're stuck in the past. We're stuck in how life has treated us. Amen. And so the Lord want to reverse a lot of these things and get us keen. Re, he, wants, he wants to reintroduce himself to you. Not in the form of religion, but in the form of a person. Amen. In the form of a relationship. One that's fulfilling. Amen. And so the Lord introduced himself and presented. We want to unveil God's voice through the scriptures by opening ourselves up to revelation. So you approach the scriptures as if you don't know. And you approach the scriptures by starting over as a child. And posture yourself as a child before the scriptures and allow the Lord, Lord Jesus to give you a fresh take. Amen. Because we can get so ritualistic in the scriptures that, that we don't begin to hear God anymore. And we ritualistically just read without really truly hearing what is he saying. So a couple of weeks ago, I taught on the allegory. An allegory is a story within a story. And so Narnia is an example of an allegory. Uh, the Lord of the Rings is an example of an allegory. Pilgrim Progress is an example of an allegory, amen? And so the reason I say that is because a veil means something is hidden. And this, this word today is about God's voice being unveiled. So we can have a veil over God where we're not clearly hearing what he's saying. We only hear in a parable. We only hear in a riddle. When we do hear God, it's in a riddle. It's not clear. We have more questions than answers. Amen. And so I want to encourage you as your pastor to open yourself up to allowing the Lord Jesus to unveil his voice to you. Now, I got a couple of steps that I encourage you to unveil his voice. And we we as a, as believers, we believe I believe in applying truth. Amen. Um, and so once Jesus showed me something, I'm looking to try to do it. You know, I'm looking to try to. See if this thing work, right? Hey, how many of y'all like that? Is this work? If, if, if it's true, then it'll be consistent. If it's true, if it's truth, then it should work. Amen? And so I want to reactivate. If you have trouble hearing God, 
um, and hearing his voice, I want to, we're going to do some things this morning that helps reactivate God's voice in you. Amen. If you're already hearing God, this, uh, it can't hurt. Amen. All it can do is just help you hear him better. Amen. So um, don't ever get to a place where you think you got it. Don't ever get to a place where you think, oh, I don't need, I already know, I already know all that. Man, that is a problem. How do you know what you don't know? You don't. So when you say, I don't have pride, that's a prideful, that could be a prideful statement. How do you know you don't have pride? Who told you that? Is that from your own self-analysis? Right? We go to the doctor and let somebody else analyze us for a reason, right? Because you can't, a lot of times you can't see. You're blind. How I many of y'all been wrong for years and found out you was wrong for years? I hate being wrong for years, right? My God, I said, Jesus, how was I wrong for years? Right? That tells you you should stay humble. You should stay humble to the fact that you could be wrong. And if it's a possibility you can be wrong, there's a reason why that is all the more reason why you should posture yourself as a child and assume you don't know until you actually know. Lord Jesus, you got to help me. Amen. And so let's go on to the next step. How to posture yourself to hear from God. Number one, um, write this down. Can you pass out those cards? Right now, uh, my wife is about to pass out some flashcards. She already passed them out? Okay, so now we got, uh, everybody got something to write with? Okay, great, 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 great. This is going to be great. All right, so um, on one side, I want you to write these steps. And we want to keep the other side blank because we're going to apply uh, uh, practically uh, some stuff this morning. I do like preaching down the building, but we do got to teach sometimes. And make sure you're getting some of these principles. All right, write this down. The first thing we should do when we are posturing ourselves to hear from God, we, re we should recognize that God is near. All right? He's near right now, right? Um, and he is desiring your attention. He is desiring for you to respond to him because um, he's already waiting on you right now, presently. He's already waiting on you to respond to him. He's already uh, showed you how much he wants to fellowship with you by sending his son, giving you his word, leading you by his spirit to a church, and reminding you that God is right there waiting on you to respond to him. He is near. The veil is torn, and he's no longer confined to a building. He's no longer confined to a specific place. See, in the Old Testament, they had hot spots. You know, they had spots that was where God's presence and his angels, the Bible gave us a glimpse of this in the spirit um, with Jacob's ladder, where he saw angels descending and ascending, all right? And then Jesus said, you will see great things to his disciples. You will see angels descending and ascending on the Son of Man, amen? And so the Son of Man and the Son of God lives on the inside of us. Now, the kingdom of God is neither here nor there, is within us, amen? So now angels are descending and ascending on us as we respond to God. So God is waiting on us to respond to him, amen? Instead of ignoring him, all right? We need to respond to him. Number two, go to a quiet place and steal your thoughts, before God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 says, here's what I want. This is the message Bible. Hopefully you got the message. All right. Try to pull the message up real quick, me. Now listen to this. I'm going to read it and then y'all can. He'll, he'll put it up here in a minute. Listen to this. He says, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, scheduled place so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there simply and honestly as you can manage. 
the focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. First thing, second thing we should do, find a quiet place so you won't be tempted to role play. You know, this is so good. Many of us put on a show for God, amen? Come on now, come on now. And we role play and we pretend and we act and we put on what we think God wants, right? And he just want to keep it simple. He just want to keep it simple. It just need to be you and him in a quiet place. Amen. Come there simply and honestly as you can manage. Amen. The focus will shift from you to God. Now, the focus that we need to have, this is what it means to quiet your thoughts. Many of us, our thoughts are running uncontrolled. Uncontrolled. They just, some of us can't stop thinking. This is why we can't sleep well. It could be a chemical problem. Yeah, you could be dealing with some cortisol issues, adrenaline issues, and things of that nature. Yeah, it's some natural things that we can look at. Amen. Um, but basically, we're not disciplined enough to be able to handle how to discipline our thoughts to become quiet before God. We have to be able to discipline our thoughts. You, you cannot allow your thoughts just to run rampant through your mind. Now, I know this might seem impossible for many, but Jesus has equipped us to be able to have self-control. Amen. So by his spirit, he can teach you. Say, teach me, Lord Jesus. Amen. There is a place. Of course, there are some issues that can be wrong in the body. And I admit, I admit that that is possible. But that's still not a reason to attempt to go spend time with Jesus and steal your thoughts. So how do we do this? Well, we begin to focus on him. We begin to focus on his goodness. Amen. All right. Point number three. And we're going to get into some more of that. Point number three. Put on some worship music. In 2 Kings chapter 3, Elijah said, bring me a minstrel. The reason he said bring me a minstrel because he would hear God's voice more clearly with quiet music. That is one way you can begin to steal your thoughts. Worship music helps you prepare to hear from the heart of God. Amen. This is why we praise and worship before you hear the word. Because it helps you hear not just what I'm saying, but what Jesus is speaking to you right now. Right. So the things that G that you need to know specifically that Jesus want to help you get through. I used to come to church and I used to be, Lord, I need a word today. I need you to speak to me today. And I used to use my pastor. and He wasn't even that smart. Right. He wasn't even that smart. But I used to use him. And I say, speak, Lord Jesus, speak to this man of God. I need you, Lord, inside. I'm like, I need you, Lord Jesus. That's why we rabbit trail sometimes. Because the topic we're talking about isn't necessarily the topic you need. So the Lord will get a man of God off sometimes just to give you what you need because you're hungry. You know, when a, uh, when a baby, you know, a baby suckling on the breast of his, her, his or her mother, everything that babies need is in that milk. You don't need nothing else. Everything that the Lord has supplied for the baby to feed on is in the milk. Amen. So I could be saying ABC, but you can be getting XYZ because that's the power of the Holy Spirit. So put on some worship music. And we about to apply all this, everything I'm about to say here, we about to apply today. Put on some words and music. All right. Point number four. Close your spiritual eyes and op close your physical eyes and open your spiritual ones. Acts chapter two, verse 25 in the Passion Translation said, Peter said this, uh, said 
This is the very thing David prophesied about. Listen to this. I continually see the Lord in front of me. He's at my right hand, and I am never shaken. How in the world is David seeing the Lord? How is he picturing the Lord? How is the Lord in front of him all the time? Well, he has spiritual eyes. So we must close our physical eyes and open our spiritual ones. The reason we close our eyes is because we're trying to focus on somebody we can't see. And it's called faith, right? You're, 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 you're focusing on someone you can't see. But your spiritual eyes is on the screen of your imagination. One of the ways we steal our thoughts is allowing Jesus to take control of the screen of our imagination. This is so powerful. I'm about to tell y'all something because the enemy does this to you all the time. This is how he gets you off. He show you doing stuff you know you shouldn't be doing. That's how he begin to tempt you and to work on you. And it's really literally an attack. And it's an attack on your vision. It's an attack on your perspective. It's a, because whatever man think of in his heart, so is he. Whatever you allow to stay on the screen of your imagination will play out in real time. And this is a very true, and the enemy hijacks the screen of our imagination because what he does is if he know if he can control your imagination, he can control you. Whoever controls the mind controls the body. All right. So we putting God's word in us intellectually and feeding our spirit. The imagination is the birthing is the wound of believing it. This is very important. If the devil uses it, God desires to use it too. So your imagination is a part is a big part of what God uses uses to get you to do something. Listen, when you see the word, right? Jesus, the Bible said that Jesus is our example. We shouldn't just see Jesus performing miracles. We should see ourselves doing it as well. I, you know, I remember before I started going out witnessing every, you know, all the time, I would see myself talking to people in grocery stores. In my prayer time, in my quiet stillness, I would begin to imagine myself doing the works of Jesus. I begin to, sh I begin to sh see myself forgiving my wife. I begin to see, picture myself doing what Jesus and his word said I should be doing. You only would do what you see. And if you do what you don't see, that's when we can get in real legalism. And we just go into the works or something, just trying stuff out. Jesus wants his thoughts to actually become yours. He wants you, when you think about him, it actually be what you want to do. Amen. So sometimes that's what the word, one of the purposes of the word, when it changes your thoughts, it changes what comes on the screen of your imagination. His words should stimulate images. Amen. So sometimes when that also what comes on the screen of your imagination is, is, is pictures that you can't help that come up. This is so powerful. This is, what, this is why I know your imagination is more spiritual than we give, give credit to, because there are images that comes up on the screen of your imagination that you can't control. They just pop up. You, just, you see yourself, you see, you see somebody cheating on you. Listen, oh, this is so good. Let me get all in it. Let me get all in it this morning. You, you see people being disloyal to you. You see people leaving. You see people rejecting you. You see yourself over in the corner crying and depressed. You see yourself, the enemy, be, he, 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 he places these images in your mind for a reason. He's prompting you to do something. He's prompting you to believe something that Jesus didn't put there. Man, Lord Jesus, help me. And so he does this by just downloading things. From your past. And sometimes he uses the memories. Y'all, yeah, how many of y'all, everybody got good memories? No. 
And sometimes he uses those memories to bring back up things that happened to you. And he's trying to get you to predict. He's trying, the devil's trying to get you to, it's, it, they somewhat prophesying what, what it's going to be like. And the Lord desires that you begin to stop those processes. How do you do that? Well, one way I've learned to do it is by speaking out loud. This is one reason why God, he, he tells us, he says, um, it ain't what go in the body that defiles a man. It what, it's, what, it's what's coming out your mouth. It's what you're repeating that's on the screen of your imagination that Jesus didn't put there. It what, it's what happened to your daddy and your mama. It, it's what seemed like is running in your family that you're repeating and seeing. You know, daddy died at 55. You know, mama died at 60. You know, daddy got this same problem. So, you know, I got to have it. No, you don't have to have it. You don't have to. If that was the case, we all have uh, some type, you know, um, some type of mental illness or stuff. That, listen, you don't have to have it. You can believe against those thoughts. You can believe against those images. You don't have to see yourself in the hospital bed. You don't have to see yourself defle defeated and broke and without. You don't have to see yourself like this. God has put, he, he's, he's put um, his word there to, to, to help you fight and have a counter uh, thought to come against what you presently thinking on. Amen. This is so powerful because you can believe something bad is going to happen, right? And it might not ever happen, but your body will respond as if it will. See, this is so important. This is so important. This is why people, this is why people are stuck. They're stuck in fight or flight mode. Let's get into this right quick. I want, I ain't, this is not in my notes, but praise God, I got three minutes. A lot of people... A lot of people are stuck in fight or flight mode. What does that mean? That means your body is responding as if someone is chasing you and nobody really is. Why? Because what comes on the screen of your imagination, your body can't, your mind don't know the difference if it's real or fake. You will begin to respond as if it's real. This is why you can't be sitting up just looking at the news all day thinking that's a good source of information. Because they, they, they're, they're, them words are designed to get you in fear. They are designed to get you in a place where you're doubting whether you're going to exist in the future. Oh, no, Jesus is my Lord. I know I'm going to exist in the future. I got work to do here on the earth. No, it ain't coming in my house. It ain't coming in my house. No evil shall befall me, neither shall any plague. Now, the words say different. Oh, I appreciate you, Dr. So-and-so. You've been trained in what you do, and I've been, I'm going to do what I've been trained to do, which is believe God's word and what he told me. I appreciate you, Dr. So-and-so, but I got a Lord and a master that's greater than anything this earth has ever seen. He created the earth. We are not subjects here just waiting on something to happen to us. God has a future for you. He has a plan for you. He has a he has an intended end for you. You don't have to sit there and take it and let them devils convince you of reality that Jesus didn't give you. It ain't in his word. My future is bright. He done showed me what, who I'm supposed to be, and that's who I'm gonna be. You better choose to line up with what he said. Instead of what them devils talking to you on the screen of your imagination, you better tell them thoughts. No, Jesus is my Lord. I do what he tells me to do. You don't control me no more. Gee, you used to control me. Old things passed away and all things become new. All things become new. I'm a new creature in Christ. I used to like that. I used to like it. You used to control me. You got to become a preacher. You might not be up here behind no poor pit, but you better get it. You better, you got to become a preacher in your mind. You better preach to yourself. You better tell those thoughts what Jesus told you to do. Don't be sitting there taking it. Preach. Do what the words say. 
Come around spiritual people. Amen. Your imagination is so powerful. And you better start saying what Jesus told you to say. Thoughts and words are captured thoughts. So when you hear yourself say something that's contrary, you're creating new thoughts. So when I preach, the reason we get happy is because my words is creating images on the screen of your imagination. That's the opposite of what the world won't produce in you. Because I already know the enemy working on you. I already know his taxes. He's already working on you. All I got to do is speak truth. And you're like, oh, my, well, praise God. Amen. Wow, that feel a whole lot better. Man, that feel a whole lot better. I receive everything he's talking about. I receive everything he's preaching, Lord Jesus. I receive it right now. I fight for my destiny. I fight for how God created me to be. I fight for it in Jesus' name. You don't have to sit there and take it. Amen. Jesus called you to fight. Amen. And so we're going to go um, and apply these truths this morning. Amen. I don't forget. Oh, man. So Jesus. All right. We're on number five. Thank you, Pastor Nate. So closing your physical eyes and opening your spiritual one. Amen. And we ain't talking about no third eye. We talking about <laughs> the mind of Christ. And, you know, we close third eyes around here. We close them. Amen. Because we don't need them. See, you need a third eye when you ain't got God's power. We don't need a third eye. We serve the one who's sitting in the future that knows everything. I don't need a third eye. What do I got to know the future for? I trust him. He knows. It's things I don't have to know. Praise God. Amen. So while we're in worship... We look to Jesus and we worship directly to Jesus. I imagine myself on the throne. Sometimes I imagine a throne just big as the skyscraper, right? And Jesus, big old feet, you know. And I'd be like, oh, you're so much bigger than I am. I worship you, God. You're a big God. You... And in my imagination, I just get caught up. And sometimes I see him pouring stuff on me like oil and anointing. And I'd be like, ah, thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Lord, you love me, God. Yes, give me all that goodness. Pour it, pour, pour. <laughs> so I use my imagination to help me worship. You don't do this. Man, I be picturing myself with the angels flying around with them. If anything is going to help me follow Jesus, I want it. Why not use your imagination for your benefit? You know, we've been taught to doubt it. We've been taught to doubt what comes on. And then we believe we believe the evil stuff. Mm, 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 mm. But it's being reversed right now. Amen. It's being reversed right now. Psalms 27 verse 13 says, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David saying here he had believed to see in order for us to see the will of the Lord. We must look. This is so good. We must look. And what we should look with our spiritual eyes, the eyes of our imagination. Amen. I have found that usually God's voice comes as spontaneous thoughts, images, visions and feelings or impressions. So what I want to open you up to is instead of trying to hear God with these physical ears, let's just use how he created us to begin to allow God to build pictures on the screen of our imagination that is really his way of communicating to us. God uses how we are created to communicate to us. Amen? So number five. The reason I got y'all uh, got you all having um, the uh, flashcards is for one reason. It's for this right here. Let's write down this point. Two-way journaling. 
two-way journaling. The Lord speaks to those that are his. And we hear his voice and the stranger we won't, we won't follow. So one of the things I want us to do this morning and one of the things that you must do, and I want you to add this to your own personal life, is begin to write down your prayers and your concerns. Lord, what do I do about this? Sometimes it's just the name of someone. Like if you got, you having trouble forgiving someone, write their name down, right? As a, as a way of uh, putting their name before the throne room, right? You'll go write their name down. Write down a problem you're having, whether it's money problems, sicknesses, whatever. Write it down. Write down your concern, all right? And write down, you know, what direction you need to go in. Do I need to take this job? Do I need to go get a job? Do I need um, how to love my wife? How to love my family members? Lord Jesus, teach me how to love you, Lord Jesus. Write down these questions, all right? I advise you to do one at a time, but you can write them all down. Like, just begin to write. It's called two-way journaling. So one side of the journal is your problems. The other side is the answers that he begin to communicate to you as you begin to steal yourself before him. As you begin to open yourself up to allowing the Lord to put on the screen of your imagination or to speak to you or to communicate to you. Sometimes he just put answers, words in as answers. Yes, no. We need to get used to the Lord communicating to us. The Bible talks about how we should believe in our heart, but it's not talking about our physical heart. Sometimes that heart in the Greek means mind. And we know our mind is our intellect, our reason, our imagination. Uh, It's more than just one thing. But God began to speak to our mind. Which can also translate our heart. So as you begin to steal yourself before the Lord, you listen to worship music, you repenting of things you have said and done, you getting right before him, you just enjoying him, write down before him your problem, and then we want to open ourselves up to how he is communicating to us in this time, actually looking for an actual answer now instead of in the future. Actually looking for what thoughts are coming to your mind now. Like, what is, what is that coming? And begin to write these things down. Sometimes it's just faith words. I love you. I, I'm for you. I'm with you. Write these things down. This is the answer. We write down the problem, but we, a lot of times we just write down the answers. And as we write down the answers, sometimes you get an answer right then and there. And sometimes you get an answer as you continue just expressing your faith on paper. All right. But a lot of times he comes to us in spontaneous thoughts. Just have you ever been just riding down the road, just a spontaneous thought coming to your head? You know, if the enemy can use that, then God want to use it as well. He's not a creator of anything. The enemy ain't he ain't he's he's not a creator of anything. He just copies God. He just used what God has already created and perverse, perverse it into something that God never intended. Amen. So we wait and allow spontaneous thoughts to flow through us, and we begin to think about, okay, Lord, is this you? Now, this is what happens. We have a tendency to doubt what comes into my mind. Now, your thoughts are coming from three sources. There's only three sources. All right? There's only three sources that your thoughts are coming from. You got the devil, and you have you and your flesh, and then you have the Holy Spirit. So if we can eliminate two of those, I mean... What odds? I mean, I'd rather, instead of guessing like we've been doing, I mean, at least I'd rather, rather eliminate, okay, he's telling me to forgive. I know it ain't the devil saying that. I mean, if he's telling me to, you know, it's easier to eliminate what God is saying when you know the word and then you have spiritual leaders to help you discern. So that's what we're going to do this morning. All right. We, we are going to apply these five steps, all right? This is, a, this is what I call a spiritual opportunity. 
The spiritual opportunity is when you have an opportunity to hear fresh information that you might not have heard before or reminders about things that God wants you to do, and you have an opportunity to do them. All right? And sometimes, you know, we veil God's voice unintentionally. We dismiss what we hear. We dismiss what comes in our mind. And we just say, oh, you know, maybe that's just, that's just me. Why don't you believe that God actually spoke to you? God, is this you? I believe you speak to me. The voice of a stranger I will not follow. So after you hear what you thought you heard, we want to test it. We want to test it. All right? And so if there is a step six, it would be that. Actually, it's on there. That's part of number five. You want to test what you hear. So how would you test it? You apply it or you ask your spiritual leaders. Amen. And we'll help pray with you all this morning because as we begin to apply these truths, we're going to help you discern. Amen.